And I get really excited, like, oh my god, like, someone's looking at my word, like, should I tell her, should I not tell her? <laughs> like, how her, like, I'm crazy, so, like, but then, I get really, really excited and motivated, and then I head to the studio, and then I work in a very busy area, uh, in Midtown, Manhattan. And so there are a lot of offices, so people, you know, carrying around newspaper get off. And once it's red, it just goes into the garbage bin. So then I get off the subway, I see the same newspaper in the garbage bin. And that's the lifespan of the art for illustrators. As long as our job is to get the viewer's attention, so in newspaper's case, someone wants to read that article, once the article is read, my job is done, and it gets warmed up. Like, I don't have a baby, but like, how long does a diaper last for a baby? Uh, you know, like, if you're lucky, a few hours, right? Like, if you're unlucky, the minute you change, it's like, done. So, I feel like it's a test. You know, if I do an art for diaper, and if I get offended that it gets thrown out in a, in a minute, and then I shouldn't be doing illustration because that's exactly what I do. And then also, I also think that is the beauty of illustration. Illustration lifespan is very short. It's important to get people's attention so people see the product, people read important articles, People will get that book because cover is nice, or people will listen to the music because album cover looks cool. Whatever that is, but you know that's a very short, but that's a very important thing. But it's also very like uh, down to earth. What? How? May I say down to earth? So um, people might think, oh my gosh, she's working in New York. Well, this is the busiest, most competitive days on earth and she might be working in this cutthroat world maybe you know like there is a lot of backstabbing going on and there is a lot of competition going on actually there are yes healthy competitions but i do what i do best and you do what you do best we might compete for jobs but if you get the job because the client like your work for this project uh, more suitable than my work, and that's that, and that's fine because next one might come to me. And so in New York, we do what we do, and we don't really cater toward what is popular, and we just stick to what we love to do, and then stick with what we are, and that keeps it really humble and great place to work. So I wanted to mention that first, and then. I will talk about 10 things I learned as uh, being a creative person. Okay, let's start with this one. Let's take at least one small little risk every single day. So this is very important for me. Uh, I noticed the uh, traffic light is very weird here, and then I don't know where to cross. I'm still learning it. Yeah? I almost got killed by trans millennials this morning. Uh, but, Hey, you know, like, I'm not talking about that, like, don't jaywalk, you know, like, don't, don't go into a coffee shop or, like, a bar and, like, drink a beer and come out, like, nothing, like, not, not, not that kind of risk. Creative risk. You know, what is the creative risk? And, and what I'm talking about is, uh, I used to work, and Kayoko talked about a little bit, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. I used to work in corporate for actually 11 years, and then, um, it, I didn't hate that job, but then like, it sometimes, like after like five years, I couldn't figure out something happened last month or two years ago because every day I felt like it was a repeat. And it was, it works out for some people and that's great. It was so not working out for me. And that's why I got out and that's why I became an artist. And so I can learn every day, I can create different things every day. And so, but then also, you know, like when you're starting to learn, uh, our work gets better dramatically so fast and it's very stimulating. After a while, you sit with your style and you don't see your work progressing as 
you know, fast as before, and it's tricky because then I might become someone who was working in a corporate like that. Did that happen five years ago? Did that happen five weeks ago? And I didn't want that to happen. And so I have to consciously decide what to do. And that comes the risk taking part. So I try to do something that I don't know how to do, or I'm a little bit scared of doing. You know, it can be, I have never drawn something like this before. Uh, I color it on uh, my drawings on Photoshop, but oh, I have never tried this Photoshop technique in my work. I'm thinking in my head, it can work, uh, but I'm not sure until I do it. Or, you know, as an artist, I shouldn't have colors I hate, but there are like I actually hate pink and purple. And so I kind of avoid it, and then I'm like, no, no, I'm an artist, I shouldn't avoid it. Next one, if it fit, I will intentionally use pink and make great pictures. So it can be anything, very small thing. And but like I will say maybe 10 to maximum 30% of new things. 30% is a lot. But I don't ever go over that because when you when the unknown is more than a certain amount, we get freaked out. You know, like we're human and we're like naturally like you know like programmed to get freaked out about things that's not really so 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent it's there is a fear and there is an excitement and you can balance it but if it's like 40 50 percent or more unless you're a huge risk taking person which i am not i will get like oh my freaking god like what i'm gonna do and if you're students it's great like you know you can take 100 percent risk and it might work or it might not work but you know a lot of you are students like that's why you're in school but as a professional someone paid me to do work looking at what i have done before and i can give them something that's completely different so that that's the balance so like 10 percent and 10 percent 20 percent it doesn't sound much the, um, as a professional illustrator, I do about 50 to 100 illustrations, sometimes more, sometimes less, <coughs> on average every year. So, like, think about it. 10% that sounds little, but if I do 10 of them, that's like, you know, easily 100%, right? Like, it doesn't work that way, like, mathematically. <laughs> like, if you're a math person, I'm sorry, it's not exactly that, but you know what I mean. Yes? <laughs> so, like, keep taking risks. And then, like, then we will get stale, we get better at what, what we do, and we will not get into, I forgot that was five years ago, five, you know, months ago. So, this next one, I think, okay, it was, it's a very short one, and it goes away. So, yeah, yeah, did it go away? Okay. okay, that was my very first job that I ever gotten paid to do. And it was a free paper, black and white illustration, uh, summer of 2002, when I was still in school. And it didn't pay much. And there were three uh, likeness of celebrities, and I actually have face blind disorder, I don't get into that. But um, So basically, for almost nothing of the payment, I spent three days and three nights creating that piece. And when I look back, I can't believe how bad it is, and I can't believe someone who was willing to publish it and pay that little amount of money for me. But I'm forever thankful. I'm still friends with the art director. We chat on um, email sometimes. Uh, but anyway, the most important part is I got paid. I worked my ass off. I was really happy when you came out because I did my best. And then I got paid, so I was even more happy. And my client, luckily, was happy that they didn't have to publish the newspaper with empty page. And, you know, we're in good terms. Um, but the most important part is that sucks. And I can say that sucks. I'm sorry, my language. I learned English from my New York friends, so I have potty mouth because New Yorkers have potty mouth. Um, but when we look at something we've done, we like when we did it, that means we're getting better. 
and you know like it's embarrassing to see what we did before and that sucks but then the great news is we have been taking that 10 percent risk so uh i i try to keep it that way even now and have high ambitions and work harder than the ambitions uh this is uh, actually not my mantra my mm -hmm. college uh, graduate school professor, his name is Mirko Illich. I actually went to the architecture of library yesterday. Beautiful, beautiful building. If you have a meeting with your student here, you have to go. Uh, they, have, they have his books, so I took a photo and I'll send it to him. So um, he was a very tough professor from former Yugoslavia and he was one of the best mentors. So this is what he told me. Um, what, it means so I actually made a little mini me. <laughs> and mini me, if it works, it moves. It's a cranky move, but it moves. So, okay. I made up ambitions into two mountains. So, here's the teaching of my professor. I always, everyone wants to slack off, right? I love to slack off. But then, like, when I feel like I'm slacking off, I tell, this to myself. So he said, have high ambitions, work really, really, really hard. You almost never get to the top of ambitions. The higher the ambition, the more work you do. And on the contrary, when the ambition is small, you feel like you did something, you still don't get to the top, and then like, okay, I did it. So you know, like, which is better? You know, having ambitions and, like, you know, if your ambition is too high, you feel like you might not get it, but you still work toward it. If your ambition is low, then you don't. So, like, always keep the ambition high. So, this is something most of us, I don't know, at least me, I love to snap off on Facebook and Instagram and then, <laughs> and then talk to friends and then, like, try to get out of my office early, but... Uh, I'm trying to tell myself this all the time. Uh, because success doesn't come to the most talented, it comes to the, the hardest worker. Um, this almost comes from like, I, I've been teaching as long as I've been out of school. So I graduated from grad school and I started teaching high school program in my um, college and then started teaching college kids um, soon after I graduated. And every year I have like, what, 30 to 60 students, depending on the year. And then I've been doing that for 15 years. I've seen many, many, many. And the students ask me, can you tell from looking at the students who's going to be successful? I know I get your attention. <laughs> and I say yes. And then they think it's the most talented because they're always talented ones in the group, right? Like naturally good. Yes, if you're naturally good and then you work really, really hard, you're unbeatable. But like, you know, like life is not that perfect. So it's either, right? Like you're, you're talented and you may feel like you don't need to work hard because you are so talented. <laughs> At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who's talented or not, the one that wins, from my experience, looking at all my former students, are the ones who work hard. So sometimes, you know, maybe a lot of you are in school, or a lot of you are thinking about changing to creative career, but we always worry about our talent. I'm not talented enough. My mom always used to say, why do you say you want to be an artist? Like, there are so many more people who are talented than you. Yes, true, mom. I still think <laughs> my mom is right. But what she didn't mention, what I can mention, is it doesn't matter. If there are so many talented people who rely on that and don't work hard. They decide to go somewhere else because it doesn't work out for them. But there are those people who might not be naturally gifted, but work really, really hard and persistent. Listen to, you know, like the criticism of the others and try to make it better. Those are the ones who make it. So, uh, you know, like those of you who are students and who want to be 
doing functional anything creative, I want you guys to remember this. I can guarantee. So creative means like what we do is problem solving. Solving problems starts from understanding what the problem is. And sometimes understanding what the problem is hard. So I'll give you an example soon. No. Uh, so you can never get the answer if you don't ask the right question. A right question for illustration. Illustration has been said to be dying for like last 80 years or something. <laughs> and I asked around like, is it dying? And then some of my friends, like many of my friends said, I have my best year last year. And I'm like, so I'm like it's not dying. And it's changing. Like everything is changing. You know, maybe the are less magazine work. A lot of us started working in the field and starting to do magazine illustration work, and there are not that many magazines. But there are a lot of online work that never existed, I don't know, like seven, eight years ago. And those are my clients too, so things change. But the biggest problem I needed to understand, and if you're an illustrator, you need to understand, is this. The world loves photography way more than drawing. Illustrators out there, but they hard to hear. It is hard, but you have to ask the hard question to get the right answer. This is the question you need to ask. So um, it is true. Everything's photo. When do we illustrators get a job? When our directors or whoever wants to hire them, like, oh, this is a photo, but no, oh, photo doesn't work. Find an illustrator. <laughs> yeah. That's how it works. If you get a note, please remember, this is how it works. So what do we do? This is my answer. So as we try to make images that photos cannot be recreated. It can be anything. You know, for me, like, my work is like kind of known for like surreal, weird things. So, you know, this is like all the Japanese yokai monsters uh, crossing the bridge. Uh, it was for a book of old Japanese tales. But anyway, like, can I have to do it for some small reason? I don't think so. I didn't think so either. Mm -hmm. So, but it can be anything. You know, like, I have, like, peers, uh, illustrators, who do a lot of different types of illustrations. I have photorealist oil painter friends. So, like, you were thinking, like, hey, wait a minute, photorealist oil painter? Like, you know, how does that guy get to work? Well, he gets plenty of work, and he does a bunch of music, uh, music in time coverage. And why? Because sometimes there are something that they want for the time cover. You know, think of a time cover. You've seen them, right? And they're usually photos, and when they're not photos, they're like photorealistic illustrations. Why? Because they want something that looks like photo, but it doesn't exist in photo. Uh, my favorite, um, my friend, uh, his name is Kim O'Brien. Uh, he does a lot of time covers. And he's done a lot of like Donald Trump covers. But if you have seen them, like once, like, you know, water is receding up to his, like, you know, he's sitting and water receding. And then one's like underwater and one's like him floating in the water in the White House. Mm -hmm. And also he did um, uh, Libya's Gaddafi when he died. Uh, you know, like famous dictator, and nobody has a glamour shot photo of Gaddafi to put on time cover, and nobody wants a glamour shot of Gaddafi on the time cover, but then also they want something that looks like photo. So if you look at a Gaddafi Time magazine cover, like it's so worth it, it's beautiful, it's his face, uh, unmistakable, but Half of it is like sand dune and like, you know, like disappearing. It's like, and it's photorealistic, really, really beautiful. So it doesn't matter. Like, don't cater toward what is popular because what's popular will go away. But what, if what you do is what you pop, what is popular, don't give it up. If you, what you do is not popular, like, you know, photorealist or painting. Don't give it up either, because if you do it, if you do what you do, what you love to do really well, your time will come. 
So, um, the, what I try to do here is like, so yes, photo. So, if I come up with sketches, you know, I come up with ideas every time I get a new assignment, and if my idea looks like, oh, it's a great idea, but that will make a great photo, <laughs> then I have to throw it out and start over again. So, that's, that's where I'm at. And learn how to say no, don't take a project that takes two nights to keep away from. It's not about the old nighters, although like, you know, that's also important. Like people bring the old shaders to go take all night work, and some people do. It's just a matter of choice. Some people love to work at night, which I really understand because it's quiet, nobody calls, I can concentrate. Some of my friends work at night day and sleep through the day. But I, I'm a, not a night person, and I need to get at least like seven hours sleep to function. And so if I feel like I'm not functioning enough, I go home, I get a short rest, even if it's not seven hours, even if it's four hours, get a rest, fresh head, come back and keep working. It works for me. But uh, in this one, I'm not talking about that. It's about the moral choice. You know, like, First thing first, when you're getting into a creative career and then you want to make a living doing it, making a living and be able to pay your bills is more important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, yeah, sure, then like money is most important, but then if you're making enough money, then you will start thinking about what is my moral decision? And if you smoke, I don't have anything against smokers. I don't smoke, but you know, that's my personal choice. And that's my friends and people's personal choice to smoke. But when my agent contacted me, oh, there's a tobacco company who wants to work with you. Uh, budget is good. But I suggest you think about it overnight because some people don't want to do it. And it's your choice. And then I'm like, huh, I never thought of that. And then I go back and thought about it, you know, like overnight. I was like, you know, like, Money is good, project is fun, but if I took it, you know, if I really need that money, of course. But like, okay, I can pay my bills this month. Do I need this extra money? And, and then feel guilty for making app to sell tobacco product and making it cool so young people who never started smoking will start smoking. And I felt like that is not a moral choice for me. So I said no, and then since then I started thinking about each project that comes my way and whether I want to take that or not take that. Yeah, like, I'm nice, so I high friends, you know, that you can be. Yeah, many of my friends work for these companies, and I don't make judgment. And a few slides ago, you saw like the background black and like a lady flying naked on the missiles. That was from Playboy. Um, I used to work a lot for Playboy magazine, and I had zero problem with it. And back then, I had two studio mates, both male, and one was like very, very Christian. And he said, "There's no way I'm working for Playboy." And I, like, that's cool. That's cool. It's your decision. I respect that. And the other guy, uh, studio mate, is gay, and he said that like, I would not want to work for Christian publications because they don't believe in my rights. You know, that's cool. And so within the small ecosystem of my studio, three people, we had what we don't think things that makes you guilty for the money you don't need, again. If the money is the most important issue, like if you, you know, like it's like putting the oxygen mask on yourself and then help others, right? So like, it's important. But if you are in position to be able to think about it, I think it's important to think because it's okay to turn on the job because there are always other people who want it more than you do. And it will be miserable for you if you take something you didn't need and feel guilty. And it will be not nice for those people who would have happily taken it. So I think this is a good way to, you know, have the right project go to the right people. And also help others, especially
creating new powers, uh, which is a new tradition. And here, so here's a video of like email comes in, it's New York Times, I want to do it, I don't have time to do it. Okay, like, can I recommend someone? And I don't always do it if I don't know the client, if they're good clients or not, because recommending is a responsibility for the people who are recommending to, and also people who I am recommending. And so I have to make sure that if I know their pool, if I just can't do it, then I'll be happy to recommend someone, especially people who are starting out new. Um, when I started out, a lot of people who had already been working in the field helped me. And some of them are my professor, and some of them are people who I have never met. And maybe they saw my illustration somewhere in a magazine and like, oh, there's like a new, I wasn't young, but like young in the experience. Young illustrator starting out and she's doing something fun. So I can take this job and I don't need this money, so I'll recommend it. And then when they do that, and then I'm very thankful that like there's nothing for me to pay back to them because they're already established. So what I do is I will do the same when I'm in the position to be able to do the same. And then if I do the same, the people who received it will do the same and it becomes a tradition. And like I really don't believe in those like cut rules, like you know, if I don't take your job, you take my job, you know, kind of thing. And also like I'm teaching a workshop right now, um, here like in the evening, and then I talk to the participants about this too, but um, any of you who are illustrators here, or that want to be an illustrator, or any creative field, you know, with internet, it doesn't matter where you live now, you know, like, you can live in Colombia and you can make New York money. You know, the worst part for me is I make New York money, but I spend New York money, which is <laughs> kind of ridiculous. I wish I can live somewhere else, but I'm still pretty happy living in one of the most expensive <laughs> places on earth, so I'm still there, but, you know, the money I make will stretch out, what, like, three times more here, probably, so, you know, like, don't think small, and don't think, you know, like, nobody's gonna care for my work because I don't live in the U.S., it doesn't work that way, and and you're all too, but especially in the United States, and with like current politics and things, it's a little bit sketchy, but the general idea of the United States of America hasn't changed. It's like people come from all over the world, we're accepting everyone who does something unique and individual, and then providing something fresh to the market. And that's all they ask. So there are a lot of Europeans working out there, and there are a lot of you know South Americans working there. So if you're thinking small, because when you think about small market, like cut through, you know, like backstabbing things, that happen. Yes, I, I hear about that everywhere I go, especially like you know the where the market is small and it's just starting up. But when you you don't have to stay here. You can stay here and you can get out because internet doesn't have borders. So I want you guys to really remember this. And, um, you know, like, um, uh, recommending newcomers is a big problem. <laughs> Project is not a success no matter what the artist did. So this one is a kind of funny one. Uh, I think this. Uh, we are the Indian Thai mix uh, free prepared food, which doesn't make any sense. But anyway, he mm -hmm. came to me, I took the job, I said yes. It wasn't exciting because I have to draw these ethnic things around this photo. But at least, you know, I did my best and also provided some ideas like, you know, oh, maybe you know, put the rail of song around her, so, because it's the, her experience of eating grapes, 
her to a whole another world she hasn't been. So anyway, I worked hard and it's not on my website. I'm not particularly proud of it. It's not my best work. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is my client was very, very, very happy. And people ask me, like, what do you think is the difference between fine art and illustration? There are no one answer, you know, there are different answers and different ways of, you know, dividing them. But for me, client comes first in illustration, and even if you do your best work, if the client doesn't like it, or if that's not what client needs, and then it's a failure. But as long as you work hard and client is happy, if you don't love the outcome, then it's a, it's a great success as an illustration. Uh, I sometimes see this, it's near me, and I took photo and there is a guy selling flowers underneath and I'm looking at like, what is this thing? <laughs> and then there was like this feeling of um, pride and embarrassment all at the same time. And once I say yes, put 100% effort into it, but it takes a lot or not. Also, this, you know, like some jobs pay a lot, some jobs don't pay well. You know? But then, as a freelancer, I have an excuse to say yes or no. If I don't want to do it, I can say no. If I say yes, I can say that no, oh, this doesn't pay well. You know, like I cannot say no, so I have to put that effort into that. Mm -hmm. However, oh, sorry. Uh, wait. <laughs> yes. Don't don't work for free and don't undercut others. So this one, as you have seen, comes with a, a blank slide. So I will talk a, a few minutes about this. A uh, long time ago, maybe five years into my career, uh, a company, which is a startup backed by a big company, but it's also, you know, it's just a startup, contacted me, and they wanted to reuse an illustration I have already done for their packaging, and they offered me, uh, there's going to be a lot of exposure in press. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, like, how this one, those of you say, uh, you already know, you don't do things for exposure. But like, you know, like, I get it, and then I said like, okay, how much is the budget? And they were like, you know, tell us about it. So I asked around because I have to come up with the right number, and I can't just come up with a random number. So I came up with the right number, and I contacted them. I didn't hear back from them. Okay, that job dies. It becomes a lot of job starts and dies, and that's fine. And then they contacted me months later and said, oh, you know, that like we still want your station, but we don't have budget. But, okay, if that's too much, we can negotiate. That's totally cool. Then you tell me. And they said, Oh, it's a startup, you know, we're a startup, so we don't have money. Can we just use the illustration? <laughs> I know, I know. And then, like, you know, I was just five years into a career, and like, I don't think I don't think they make anything. Like, you know, yeah, it might be okay. And I just gave the, them the artwork. And surprisingly enough, I got a lot of press and exposure, <laughs> which is funny because it doesn't happen, right? Like, people who don't know this, remember, don't ever give up your art for exposure and press because it doesn't happen. Like, in this case, it happened, and I was like, okay, that was cool, whatever. And I move on. Six months later, I get an email from an illustrator in Europe I have never met, and I don't remember who it was. And she's like, you know, me and I said, you know, that hi, my name is such and such, I'm an illustrator in wherever I can that. Um, you know, like this company contacted me, they wanted the free art from me, and I thought that was weird because it's back that a big company, although it's a startup, and I Googled who did the last, you know, package design, and it was your work, so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get your input. And then I was like, shit! <laughs> you 
promise exposure to art, arts. So basically, they learn art is free, right? And this is a tricky situation. A lot of people who are starting now, you know, when we're starting now, let's face it, everyone's desperate. I was really desperate because we won't get work until our work is our work is seen. So and these are there are sharks out there. They know we're in that position. They dangle the exposure and try to get free art, right? But if everyone buy into the bait and start giving our artwork for free, if everyone here did it, like within years, illustration industry will be completely dead. And which is already happening in like photo, right? Like photo nowadays, people have like smartphone and press the button and everyone feels photographer and people who are hiring photos don't know good from bad, so they just use Instagram photos to promote their things and now it's really difficult for photographers to get work. So we can't do that. And then I'm embarrassed to say this because I've done it. But at least, you know, like I say, I have made a lot of mistakes, I have, and I still will, and that's how we grow up and, you know, become a better artist and better person. But there are some mistakes other people have made for you, so you don't have to make it, and this is one of them. So if you haven't thought about why giving art for free for exposure is bad, like, think again, this is why. And Next one sounds contrary, but it's not. I'll explain. Sometimes there are more, there are art things more rewarding than money. And so I kind of encourage you to work for free. But I'm not working ask you to work for free or for almost no money for anyone who can pay. If it's a company, they should pay. I'm talking about Maybe you know your best friend is starting a food truck and you're the only artist he knows and they won't kick ass low and they don't have any money and then you will help. You know, you I, I designed some of my friends uh, wedding invitations because you know that's what you do for friends, right? And our family. But um, what is most important is the charity work. Charity work, I try to work with non-profit organizations whenever possible. And yes, some organizations do have money, but most of them, if I don't take their money, they can use the money for a better goal. So that's how I feel like. Of course, I pick and choose because they're good non-profit and they're bad non-profit, right? You guys know that. Uh, but um, I, I try to do that. And then also, what you need to remember is if someone's not paying you, even if it's your best friend's food truck, and if he tries to art direct the hell out of you, you stop them. Yo, you're not paying me money, I'm doing you a favor, you don't effing art direct me. <laughs> I say that to someone who asked me for um, wedding invitation because she went. I think people may go crazy for their weddings. I understand that, but like, don't do that to your best friend who's giving you time to create, you know, the best wedding invitation as possible. So hey, uh, so no money in total, creative freedom. Remember that. I'll give you some samples. So do you guys know Kid Baba? It's like a really cool toy vinyl toy design company. I'm sure it's pretty popular. Or oh, at least you have seen them. They they create these like um. And the, they make huge ones. Yeah, this one's like this big. I did some years ago. And it is like they send, ship out this gigantic one. It's one like from both sides. And then um, we can paint it and then I'll do whatever we want and like bring it back, I ship it back. They do um, exhibition. And then once the exhibition is done, people bid for it on eBay and they buy it, the proceeds goes to save the children fund. So as an illustrator, I always do narrative representation or conceptual work. So I know I'm tricky wrong with people feel like, I'm a great face, you know, you can go make great face out of it, like, no fucking way, I'm 
Sorry, people, but I'm doing that for my work, so like, let me just draw pattern. <laughs> and I had a lot of fun. I probably took two of during the summertime. I could go on and off like one week. And I had to hire my former assistant, a former student who was the graffiti wizard. So he knew how to prime every surface because I didn't know how to prime the PVC surface. And he did that and I paid him. So it's like a little bit of money taking it away. But like summer is not the busy time of the year for us. And then the green thing is I took the EV result. So someone bought it for $1,275. I didn't see a penny of it, but I went to save the children from it. You know, I tried to donate money to charity whenever, especially like at the end of the year, I research with charities or things I believe in. But it's really hard to donate like a chunk of money to someone. And then I, we always forget, like I forget because I'm surrounded by people who are creative. So they can create like magic with their, you know, hand and to make something beautiful. And that's kind of normal. But then in, in the broad context of the world, people who are creative is like a very rare special skill. And yes, we can save up money and give to charity we believe in, but if we use our talent and skill and make something that might worth even more than you give money to someone. So um, we can't forget that we have that magic power and also, you know, it's a great karma going, and then it's really rewarding. First time I did it, like the feeling you get, the happiness you get, is more than I got paid well for my job. And of course, it's also like you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then help others. So take care of yourself first. Like if you're thinking of getting into Korea in creative field, or like, you know, you're still struggling. And then put your life on track in once that some start thinking about doing something good. And so it happens like pretty recently, like this is sometimes what I do, like I really don't have a lot of time to do like dummy type of work right now and it hasn't come to my way recently. But uh, what I can do is um, when nonprofit organization ask me to donate work, uh, not donate work, like work, and they like, oh, this we're nonprofit, we don't have a lot of budget, and this is the budget, can you do it? I say yes, and then I look at how I did. Can I pay my bill this month? And I'm like, okay, I'm doing okay, so you don't have to pay me, this is a donation for me. So that is like one way of helping nonprofit, especially the ones you believe in. And nothing in life is a waste of time. Yeah, so this is the office I worked in. Actually, you know, like I was told this is an old building and they just demolished it. I have a lot of terrible memory. And then every time I go back to Japan, my former coworkers say, come visit our office. Like, how no fucking way! <laughs> and then I'm so glad it's gone. I never ever have to visit again. <laughs> so anyway, I had a day job. Uh, as Kayoko said, I had a day job for 11 years. Um, I studied advertising and marketing. My major was in business and my undergraduate uh, college. Uh, I always got to draw and paint, but no, I was young and I couldn't make up my mind. So like I always in all when I get my you know 18 year old student and like, oh well, it's great you convince your parents and you know you want to do art and then you came to art school because that is a decision I couldn't make. And my parents, like many parents, they're like, oh art, you won't make money, don't do it, right? And then like, you know, do you know Van Gogh? I'm like, yeah mom, that's like, you know, like century ago, but like deep thing. No, <laughs> and uh, that, that's the most common perception of your parents thinking about art. Mm. So I took a uh, path, like easier way out, and I majored in advertising because I thought that was the most practical, uh, most creative in a practical world. 
And I'm gonna pee on dog in this company, which I usually try not to mention because I worked in PR and they they hated former employees that said the name of the company and talk shit about them. Mm -hmm. Can I say talk shit? Nobody knows what to say. Anyway, that's me. I was trying to blend in and I didn't. I actually didn't like it didn't work out on day one, but my job in PR was actually interesting and I was surrounded by really, really nice people. I still keep in touch with my co-workers and some of my bosses, especially like now Facebook and connecting with them. And so like it wasn't bad and maybe it wasn't bad and steady paycheck and all that. That was why I couldn't leave for 11 years because I thought from day one, like, uh -huh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stay. And then all of a sudden, 11 years. And you know, like, the, I was like a naive young person, and the experience really helped. Like, half of the time, as an illustrator, I'm doing business administration work of my business because it's a small business of one person illustrating the office. And I have to do my invoices, I have to do my fee negotiations, I have to ask for money if they're not paying, or, like, you know, I have to check and read through my contract, like all these things. It takes half of the time, which some of you might not think that that's how it is. But I learned all that while I was working. And then, so then like after 11 years, how the hell I quit, right? Because there might be some of you like, I wanna quit my job and do something creative. So it's not universal, but this is what happened to me. <laughs> this is my last boss. Oh, how nice I will make his head. And I actually looked for his photo because he has an uncommon last name. And so I Googled it and like, bingo, I found the photo. And I was like, wow, that is so mean to show his face. So I faked it. And so for the end, like last two years of my career, I had like, not just one, but like there was one more. Uh, two bosses. Until then, I had great bosses, and two bosses who are like mentally abusive. They seriously, seriously hated me. Probably for a reason because I'm opinionated and I didn't fit into the office. But like they were really, really, really mean. And I was crying in the bathroom like every day. And then you know when you hit that bottom. I mean, it's terrible, looking back, it was terrible, terrible, but then again, the only way to get out is get out, right? So I think after 11 years, I wasn't sure, I was like, why am I tolerating this for monthly paycheck? And then like, you know, what do I get at the end of the day? And I looked at the ladies who's working in the office who's near the, you know, the retirement, and like, what I get is that if I tolerate. And then that was not exactly what I wanted. And then like, what did I always want? Like, I loved art and I never had the courage to study it. So, you know, uh, luckily I was saving most of my uh, paycheck. So maybe this is time for me to use it and go somewhere. And that's, um, uh, that's when I moved to New York. I started art school. That's my first year in art school. I did terrible oil painting because I wanted to be an artist and I know that what I love. And that's my classmate. I forgot his name. Cuba. <laughs> and that's my professor. And so like, you know, like I felt when I went back to school at age 34, of course I felt old. Now looking back at 34, mm -hmm. but anyway, I felt old. And I felt like I wasted time, but after after four years of being back in art school, I realized that it wasn't a waste of time. You know, like when other students are freaking out about graduation, I was like, let me out of here. I've been working for 11 years and I've been back to four years in school and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm ready to go out and work again. So I didn't have freak out, like, you know, like it, it really worked out. And so nothing is waste. And 
starting day is for the yogis that we always think we are old, regardless of 34 or 54 or 40. Do you remember when you were 14, you felt old? <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I know. Because we have never, you know, we have, this is the oldest. Today is the oldest we have lived, right? So we always feel old, right? It's natural. Get over it. I'm, I'm telling myself to get over it. Get over it. Because that's how it is. Tomorrow you're older. You know, but that's how it is. But also, today is the youngest you will ever be in the future. So if there is something you really want to do, don't use the A for excuse. And I sometimes get messages like this on Facebook and Instagram. This guy is like 56 years old. And I saw myself as an artist. Like, how nice is that? Like, this is why I feel like I do this. Oh, this is why I feel like I need to talk about that I started this thing late and I'm old. And I'm old and I'm okay. And so don't ever use oldness as an excuse. And not everything, it's my last thing, is not everything we want in life comes true. This is true. Because like people say, hey, like you say that, like, you know, that like, if you really want to do something, do it. But what if I don't accomplish it? And I mean like, you know, you think I'm standing here and I'm accomplished? Like, no, like it's like my clients, none of my clients call me for two weeks. I think that my career is over, nobody's ever gonna call me. There are all these younger people who are doing amazing stuff, and I'm over. And I might be, I might be over tomorrow. And I always think it that way, but if I'm over tomorrow, maybe I'll pursue something else and which is gonna be okay. So life, the beauty of life is there's full of surprise. We never know something gets successful or not. And the, in order to live a life that has no regret for me, is do it. Like, for the longest time, until I went to art school, I felt very, very self-conscious and felt inferior every time I met someone who went to art school. Because I always wanted to art school, but I wasn't strong enough to convince my parents and then I didn't have a strong enough will. And then someone said, oh, I went to art school. I'm like, oh my god, like, and then let me hide. Because like I'm a, I'm a loser. Mm. And then the only way to change it is go to art school. And then it wasn't that of like a mysterious black box. But if you don't do what you really want to do, later on you say, what would have happened if I did that? It's the worst, worst, worst regret ever. So don't do that and start doing it. If it doesn't work out, you can move on. You know, it's okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are, both, no, those are my advice. So hopefully I didn't bore you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, but it's, it's not like a copyright issue or anything, 
And also, like, you know, of course, as a illustrator, I have to be careful, like, you know, I don't copy certain photos. If I'm doing portrait, I always get multiple photos, so, like, it's not a copy of any single one, because my art is protected by copyright, but the photographer's works are as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, one instance I got almost sued, which didn't happen, was I did a... San Francisco magazine called me to do a portrait of 18-year-old criminal who just went to, into jail. It was not a news in New York, but it was a huge news in uh, San Francisco. And he just learned 18, and he stole someone's Lamborghini, and it was like a famous chap. And they drove around and got into car crash or something. Right? And he went to jail, and then there was no photo, and they needed to write the article. And I did a, uh, portrait. Back then, I had my phone number on my website. A lot of people did. Not a lot of people do now, but because a lot of people still call uh, to give us job. And then my phone rings, and this like crazy frantic lady calls me. And then like you know like, like my son does not look like that. <laughs> like what? Excuse me, lady. Who's this? And it was his mom. And then he said, like, like I will sue you, like, you know, you you portray my son as a criminal and he is not like blah blah blah. And then like we talked for a while and then like I can't of course he's she's frantic because her son just went to jail, right? And then so like we're kind of talking and like I was just saying like, you know, like things to come down. I don't even remember. She calmed down a bit, but she was still frantic, but she's like, well, you seem like a nice lady, but like, you know, like, it's, it's funny. And then she hung up, and I was like, holy shit, what am I going to do? And then I went to an illustration conference right before, and there was a lawyer who used to be an illustrator, but she was interested in copyright law issues, so she became a lawyer, and now she helps artists. And I found out her contact, and I called her for consultation. And then she was very kind to help me, and she happened to be based in San Francisco. And she said, you know, this case, like everyone's talking about this case, and it happened in front of everyone's eyes, like, you know, it's not whether he did it or not did it. He is in jail because he did this, and everyone saw it. And she, this mother is known for like being like a little bit crazy. And then like, she's this like, looks like Donatella Versace covered in like, you know, designer clothing. And so she's a talk of town too. And she's like, don't worry, in this case, he's 18. So, you know, he's a legal age to be, like have the mugshot out and they can't sue you. And of course, everyone knows about her and nobody will represent her in this case. So you should be rest assured. Well, so that was the only time that I did have to talk to a lawyer. Um, you know, I was just talking about um, getting a liability insurance, and I haven't, but then um, more and more corporations are getting bigger, right? Especially in the US, you know, they learn, they learn, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and corporate law becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Our contract is getting longer and longer and longer. So I was talking to some of my friends and, you know, like, we should just get liability insurance because it's not that much ex that experience. But we, he said, he tried, but it's a little difficult for illustrators to get liability insurance because insurers don't really understand why we need it for. So we have to find the right company, but like, I will do it soon. So I don't know if that answers my real question, but... It did, and then I have another question. Yes. So I'm going to hug the microphone for a little bit. Then what happens, for example, if somebody plagiarizes your work? You know, that it, that is also, it doesn't, it didn't have, it hasn't happened too much. And in China, if you are an image maker, and if your image is out there, your image is probably copied and sold on something. And people had sent me links of t-shirts and clothing and tote bags and things. 
if we can't do anything about it because they know what they're doing and then like they make sure the manufacturer you know like there are people who are selling you can pick these people contact these people and stop it but they that won't stop these bigger manufacturers to manufacture them and um, you seem to know the copyright law well, but there are like two copyright laws, right, in the, the world. And China is basically a copyright no man's land. And so if you work, I bet everyone work and copy somewhere. And I mean, like, you really can't do anything about it. I'm sorry, I have a better answer for it, but like, that's what it is. Like, it's not they're making millions. But sometimes imitation is a form of flattery. Oh, that's, I, I hate that. I hate that, you know, like, people say that all the time, but like, yes, I mean, like, you know, like, young artists getting small influences from uh, established artists, like, that's fine, I'm on the table, like, and you know, like you shouldn't be angry about that. But there are sometimes like people like intentionally copying, and that becomes a problem. Uh, but like that's like an individual case, right? Like if someone's obviously copying, like I try my best to talk to that person and like, hey, like you know, like let's talk. And sometimes it works, but most of the times they're in denial. So like I have gotten into a situation that like someone's like really copying and he denied it and then I talked to him in private and now he's like counter attacking me like publicly with my name on it and saying like you cause this like piece of shit. <laughs> and so like you know like you the best at that point the best thing I can do is ignore it, right? So that's what I'm doing. Thank you.
that make a things that are so awesome. Yes. Have you ever been always scared? I mean, I, I look at my students and maybe they are like still technically not there, but you know that you guys, all of you are the future because you're younger than me. I'm getting old and you like, you know, turning into future and I look like, man, these are the future and I'm over. And I was like, I feel that all the time. I think like, it's okay. You know? Turning into future. <laughs> and so my way of dealing, well, like the student thing aside, of course I had student, I have to teach and like, you know, deal with them. And that's okay. But sometimes I look at too much art in the same field, and then I get overwhelmed and feel like, why do I get work? <laughs> and I'm like, there are awesome people out there, oh my god, like, maybe I've been like deceiving people for the last 15 years, but like, I'm over. Then like, I stop looking at these and just focus on myself. You know, like, okay, like, those are great and great, but they were doing different things, and am I doing the best I can do, or am I slacking off, so I make myself, you know, like, I compare myself to myself, because, you know, the best you can do is the best version of you, right? Because you can't start comparing you to others, then you, it's easy, like, it's very, like, common thing to get freaked out. Then like, don't look, focus on you, you know, what you need to do, how do you get better, you know, am I putting the best work into my work, and then what can you, what can I do next? So, just focus on you, don't focus on the rest. And I think like, if you know enough what's happening already, it's kind of healthier to put those things aside, you know, I get like illustration annuals and things, but I realized lots coming every year, you know, they come in like a shrink wrap and they sit unopened. I'm happy to own them, but like I don't need to see them, I feel like. Like, let's focus on what I do. Because there are like, you know, these new things, new work coming up, new people coming up. Those are great. We have to be aware of it, but we don't have to constantly bombard ourselves in. Hi, um, I have two questions. First one, you develop a very iconic style. Um, I would like to know what references of your life you put in your work. Every time. <laughs> no, I mean, like, no, I know, you have like a lot of um, iconic uh, images, elements from Asian culture, but right now I'm just thinking about the swimmers, the black and white suits, like where does that come from, what elements of your, your life are you just... So, if know? I start explaining everything, it's going to take an hour, so I, I don't, but like, it's, it's really true, like, and I was like, I, I was born during when all art was popular, which I actually didn't realize it until I actually learned art history and started regularly going to art museums and see shows. And those stripes and black and white the graphic things were what was around when I was born. And then I started using it because I like it, but I didn't know why I like it. And then I realized it's part of what I was surrounded by. So everything on what I said, everything is true. Like my you know, my work looks like Japanese to you probably, but if I show it to Japanese people who live in Japan, they say it's like a weird foreigner did it. Like, you know, like but like someone who loves Japan but like not from Japan. So and that might sound weird, but that's who I am, right? I don't feel I am a Japanese, but I don't feel I am American. So my work exactly represents that. And so, you know, everything I put in, like, yeah, like whatever image I make, every time there's a theme or concept, but overall, it's just 
my life and who I am goes into the picture. And if people see that, I think I'm doing something right. The second question is, I'm an artist. I'm an industrial designer. I like to do illustrations because I like to draw. But I've always wondered, how do you charge for an illustration when you're not an illustrator? I've done art collectives, like friends, but I've always been afraid to charge for my work. So that's an, another hard one, like I can talk for hours. Then I have to give you a short question. Whenever I teach, I tell students to like look, start looking for work in magazines and newspapers and books because they give you the budget. And you say yes or no, depending on if we work for you, if we work for, you know, pays for your effort. And then once you do enough of them, you have an idea of what the overall pricing is. And you can start saying, oh, I usually get more than that. I usually, you know, do this. And I had the exact same question when I was starting out, because when you're starting out, random people ask for random things. Like, it's really hard to price it, and I can't really answer that question. But try and aim to get work from things that already have budget. And so for magazines, usually, what you get and what I get for New York Times for the same size is the same price. Maybe I get $100 more because I've been working long enough. That's about it. So you don't have to negotiate. All you do is decide whether you want to do it or not, yes or no, and they pay you. So that is what I suggest. I think that's the question. <laughs> I understand you want to ask a lot of your questions, but we have to finish. So thank you again for your assistance, and thank you again for your question, everything. And uh, I want to inform the uh, um, uh, Japan, Japan Center will open 3rd of December this year, finally. And now we... We are now celebrating the 110 years of diplomatic relations in Colombia and Japan. So please follow the uh, Japan Center's uh, Facebook and uh, we will work harder to, to promote uh, Japan's and thank you very much, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.